Simon and the Collective. For this confession, we've got to go back to the summer of 1968. It was the school holidays and there were three of us, age 12, 13 and 14. To make it simple, I would call this Urchins 1, 2 okay. and 3. What I remember of the holidays was that it seemed to rain a lot and that made it a bit difficult to occupy our days. What we did have, though, was full pockets. Definitely not with money, but with an array of items that would help us through the day. There are hankies, lolly sticks, sweets, pen knives, different times, <laughs> fishing hooks, tin foil and toilet paper. The most important thing of all, though, to us was our fishing line. We never left home without it. The morning of this particular event, the three of us met up as usual. What are we going to do today, says Urchin 1. I don't know. What do you want to do today? <laughs> Said Urchin Said 2. Said Urchin 2. Yeah. I don't know. What do you want to do today? Said Urchin 3. This is yeah. Jungle Book. Wow. This is the, the three vultures <laughs> from, Baltimore, from, uh, from Jungle Book doing a Scouse kind of beetly accent. Uh -huh. This went on for a few minutes. Then Urchin number 2 says, look what I've got. And out of his pocket came a safety pin. This is no ordinary safety pin. This was a great big nappy pin with a security device so it wouldn't come apart too easily. Anyway, after urchins, one, it's, you, can't, you don't get them anymore because everyone uses disposable yeah. nappies. But back in the day, uh, this was quite a common sight. Anyway, uh, after urchins one and three scrutinized it, it went back in urchin two's pocket. That day, we thought we'd go into town to see what we could get up to there. And our town had and still has a very big department store. And as you walked into this store, it had two staircases by the front door, one to the left and one to the right. On top of the left-hand staircase was where the women's outfitters were situated. And about 10 feet from the staircase were the immaculately dressed tailor's dummies. We ascended the stairs and were walking past the mannequins when urchin number three says, I've got an idea. What's that then, say one and two? Well, you'll see, just passes the safety pin and then cover for me. Urchin number three takes the safety pin and as we covered him, he secured it to the waist of one of the mannequins. Pass me the fishing line, he says. And another couple of seconds later, the fishing line was attached <laughs> to the safety pin. What do we do now? Well, how about walking naturally down the stairs? Well, we did as we were instructed. And as we did so, urchin number three was letting the line out until we got to the bottom of the stairs and onwards into the women's perfumier. Okay, perfumier, <laughs> yes. Is that what they called them in 968? Anyways, the women's perfume section, Correct. where there was probably a choice of about five. The three of us now had hold of the fishing line, one at the top of the stairs and two at the bottom, and within a couple of seconds, the previously empty staircase was filled with about six or seven happy shoppers, completely oblivious to our fishing line. This was our cue. Pull, came the command from Urchin <laughs> 3, and pull we did. And the dummy, wearing, I should say, an immaculately tailored outfit, suddenly came to life and started winging its way from the first floor perfumier to the top of the stairs. It stayed upright until about the eighth step, <laughs> teetered a bit, and then hurtled head first down the stairs. Wow. At first there were a few gasps, then there were screams, and the previously happy shoppers didn't seem to know whether to go up, down, or dive sideways. To the casual observer, it looked like someone was throwing themselves down the stairs, dressed immaculately in a 63 piece, <laughs> whilst gyrating at the same time. As the mannequin crashed to the bottom of the stairs, a concerned group gathered around the fallen dummy just to check he was OK. Actually, he'd lost his head and one arm, but apart from that, he looked perfectly fine. Knowing it was time to take a swift exit, urchins one, two and three hurtled as fast as our laughter could take us for the doors. We managed to get out, and st uh, uh, get out of the store and over the road and hide behind a hedge. There we stayed for at least 15 minutes, not able to speak because of the laughter that was hurting our bellies too much. Now, I don't recall any headline in the local paper about marauding mannequin fells shoppers on shop staircase or dancing dummy comes to life. So hopefully uh, no one had any lasting scars from the shock of this experience. Maybe they even saw the funny side. At that age, we didn't care that there might be someone of a nervous disposition. This is taking all your ammunition away, Bobby. Oh, I realise that. We didn't think of someone of a nervous disposition on the staircase or someone who had a more morbid fear of flying dummies all we cared about was having a little jape at someone else's expense however 
I realize now that I should ask for forgiveness from these unsuspecting happy shoppers, as I'm sure they didn't get up that morning and think they were going to be set upon by a tailored dummy. I hope you can absolve us from this jolly little jaunt that brought much mirth to us and a lot of terror to others, says Urchin One. It's almost like a Doctor Who episode where a possessed uh, mannequin in a 60s store uh, comes to life. But it's not a portal into another time-space continuum. Uh, it was just a prank from the Urchins 1, 2 and 3. I wonder if people recognise that department store and recognise the town. Anyway, Bobby, what are you saying there? What a lovely story. There's that time when, you know, you left home with a piece of bread in your pocket, isn't it, really? It's kind of 8 o'clock in the morning, came back at tea time a and no one worried. Why, why would you leave well, with a piece just, of bread? Well, you know, that was the food for the day. You know, it was kind of, as long as you had wow, a crust really? of bread and you came back. Those, those is this Dickensian London? This no, is it's, like... still, it's 1968. It's, you know, it wasn't long. People that... had cakes then, All right, you then. know, and, and chocolate bars. Okay, there was a chocolate bar in your pocket but basically you went out in the morning and you came back didn't you when it was tea time and no one wondered where you were and assumed you were right? climbing trees and up to nothing no you were in department stores which of course are much more interesting than trees because they're full of sweets and cakes there's part of me that really loves the mischief in you so as an onlooker i love it and would call you monkeys if i worked there i would call you monsters and you should know better and, and thick you your ears because yes. people did that in 1968 <laughs> and it i would tell okay, your though. mum so um i think in this case can i forgive you the thing is, you could have really hurt somebody. So on this occasion, <laughs> you're not forgiven. You could classic. have really hurt somebody. Yeah, classic, classic Bobby. Classic Bobby. Uh, what'd you say, well, Matt? I mean, obviously, you know, as we've said, different times. Uh, these were, you know, it was, it was fine in the 60s. Uh, I don't know why. What, why were they carrying tinfoil around? That doesn't make any sense. What can you possibly do with tinfoil? Well, you can put it on your head yes. in, to stop the x-rays from the space copters. Simon okay. was reading my mind. Yeah, exactly so, what I was going to yeah, say. That's right. I'm reading your mind because I've got some tin. <laughs> Foil on my tin head. foil on your head. Um, uh, I, I think. What Have this, you never put tin foil on your tin head? Tin foil, never. You get it, X-rays from space. Really? Yeah, and mm, you can read. That seems likely. Special messages and uh, magnetic waves. Um, so I'm going to say this is down to far too long a summer, summer holiday. Summer holidays appear to go on forever. Uh, speaking as a parent, and uh, and therefore kids have to find something to do because you know it's not going to be the end of August anytime soon. So I'm going to say forgive. Dear Father Simon and the Collective, I write to you seeking forgiveness for a moment of, shall we say, travel tension seven years ago, which I fear may otherwise haunt me for the rest of my days. See, it all started very badly on a Monday when Sally Traffic informed me that there was trouble on the A1, and this meant having to do the dreaded diversion through the centre of Leeds. Ordinarily, I wouldn't be too perturbed. However, I was already running late and had an important client meeting arranged although I was quietly hoping for a force majeure would occur so it could be postponed. Uh, ask Matt. After a relative... You, that's it now. There's no more references to you, Sally, so you can relax. It's just that... I thought I was going to start doing the whole confession. OK, I'll see if I can work you in. Would you mind? After a relatively free-flowing diversion, I then hit the city centre and gridlock ensued. You could see the frustration on drivers' faces and mine was no different places to go, people to see, neither of which is going to happen imminently. I sat in a single file traffic jam which moved at the pace of an asthmatic turtle for what seemed like forever until eventually there was some movement. I noticed further ahead that there was a road from the left where cars were waiting to pull out onto our carriageway and so began the game of after you. Now I'm sure everyone is aware of traffic jam etiquette. You let someone out then the next vehicle waits to be let out by the car behind you. However, on this occasion, the etiquette gods were not playing ball. Are you aware of, uh, of this etiquette? Would, uh, would yeah. you say that's the fairly standard? I think so. I think you have to kind of, unless they're being silly, in which case you wouldn't let them go through. But I think generally yeah. that's true. This is the traffic jam etiquette uh, of which Dean is telling us. After you, that's the game you play. You see, what happened is, as I got nearer to the junction ahead, it became my turn to let a car pull out which I duly did, with the globally recognised hand gesture of, well, go on then. Everything was fine until I noticed that the next car from the same junction was now sneaking forward. Ah. I thought to myself, well, surely he's not trying to pull out. Does he not know the rules? So I edged ever forward, but much to my dismay, so was this rule breaker. I caught his eye and decided to wave my finger, as if to say, no chance, pal, amongst other things. But to my amazement, he still crept forward. After a short game of accelerate, break, accelerate, break, we both <laughs> seemed to hit the accelerator simultaneously, and before I knew it, we had collided. 
after taking a moment to assess what had just happened, the red mist descended. I approached his vehicle and unleashed a barrage of, what the heck do you think you're doing? And, I let the car in front of you go out, not you. And, do you not know the rules? And so on. And I'm ashamed to say, a few expletives may also have been thrown in for extra effect. Well, the driver of said vehicle appeared to remain calm. He wound down his window ever so slightly and motioned to me to come closer. At this point, my adrenaline was through the roof, and as I leant towards the window, I heard the words that will remain forever in my memory. Did you not realise I'm being towed? <laughs> <laughs> oh, superb! So I, see, so I seek forgiveness. I'm not only from the helpless man who had to endure my misguided fury, but also from his two children who, unbeknownst to me, were in the back seat of the car and had to listen to the potty mouth annoyed man outside. Who was Dean from Harrogate? Yours in hope. You can see, you know, you can see and you can understand because the rules are the rules. He was trying to sneak out. It's just he didn't really have much say in the matter. So here we go. Let's try uh, Sister Rebecca for an understanding voice. Maybe. Listen, well, you know those um, signs that say converge like a zip? You know those signs? They should have had a sign there that said that or something. You it know, doesn't say converge like a zip. What does it say? Does it? Well, just... Anyway, something like that. But, yeah, I mean, it is a rule. I mean, it is a rule, but uh, people often break these rules, don't they? And I think this actually shows that getting road rage for an incident like that, road rage where you are so angry you could, you know, easily go and hit somebody, is really not the way forward. No. You know, much better just to go and politely have a word and take the moral high ground, I think. And I think, you know, it's quite funny, actually, that he got his come up. And So I think, you know, I, I can't ever... Um, say it's okay to shout at someone, Dean, so I'm afraid you're not forgiven. Well, you could shout at someone from, from the comfort of your own yeah, car. Yeah, but, but swearing and going up to them threatening No, that's me. not very yeah. nice. Not very nice at all. Uh, anyway, yes, now we have uh, the aforementioned Mother Superior. Well, you have, con Rebecca, just a little a little road knowledge for you. You, you have... <laughs> Oh, yes. not patronising at all. Yes, Here come on. Yes, actually, but listen up now. No, listen up. Yeah. Listen up, Rebecca. Ah. You, ha you have converged signs when there are roadworks. This particular problem was caused by extra traffic going through an area because a road nearby was shut. So they wouldn't have put signs up for that. So they just Obviously. had to... They, you, you, they had to sit, think on their feet, really, just so you know. Um, so, uh, Thanks for clearing that uh, one That's out. fine. And you see, I think road rage is a... You know, I can't say I've never Travel had tension, it. I called it. Travel tension. I've had a bit of travel tension in my time because um, I've driven for miles. So I kind of understand. And no one likes to be made a complete fool of in the way that uh, Dean was. But uh, so, Dean, I don't know, you know, you, you, you made the traffic jam worse by not looking ahead, by not thinking ahead. So I think on that basis alone, I can't forgive you. It's all down to Brother Matthew, then. Um, I, I think this is a superb. I was convinced he was going to be a priest, the, the guy near <laughs> the car. But well, anyway, he, he, he may, may um, anyone who's ever been in a car with me knows that I never, ever take the moral high ground. I am always bellowing at other people in other cars because, frankly, the, I, I behave like the street is mine and you're deigning to be in my way. <laughs> uh, so, Dean, I am definitely going to forgive you because you uh, did what probably I would have done as well and you provided an excellent punchline, the fact this guy's being towed. Superb. Well done. Father Simon and the posse of potential pardoners says Beatrice. <laughs> My very good friend, let's call her Angela, is a remarkable, awe-inspiring woman. She has been diagnosed with cerebral palsy from birth and pretty much just gets on with life. We met when I worked at university. Uh, she attended and uh, she the university she attended and we've been friends ever since. Aside from her zillions of other achievements, Angela has a black belt in karate. It is the acquisition of this particular accolade in the 90s that is the subject of this confession. Angela's black belt qualifying event was being held in Belgium and she required some extra assistance with getting dressed, managing her meals and propelling her wheelchair. She asked me if I could accompany her. Now, being a poor student at the time, a weekend trip abroad with a friend and a wonderful opportunity, I jumped at the chance. We travelled from London to Belgium via Eurostar, spent a lovely busy weekend. Angela worked like a Trojan, achieved her black belt in karate and we also did a little shopping and ate some nice food. But all too soon it was time to return to London. We were returning on a Monday afternoon, but somehow, in the process of breakfasting and packing, we realised we were getting a little pushed for time. We arrived back at the Eurostar terminal with minimal 
time to spare before the train left. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Eurostar in Belgium, but the terminal is actually a large complex with trains leaving on platforms that are on different levels. And at least back in the 90s, it was not particularly well signposted. This certainly didn't help someone who was late, in a hurry, with two decent-sized holdalls full of clothes and with a friend who is a wheelchair user. So after being directed by passers-by to various incorrect platforms and dashing in and out of lifts, getting increasingly confused in the process, the fateful incident occurred. I asked a fellow passenger for the final time where our platform was, and he pointed. It was within sight. All we had to do was traverse the travelator. You know those flat escalators that you get at airports? I wasn't even sure they were called a travelator, but that's... Yeah, so you know, must be, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's what it is, normally flat. Uh, I had encountered the travel at many airports before I confidently approached this one, says Beatrice. Once I got closer, however, I noticed that this one, unlike the other horizontal ones I had previously used, sloped downwards towards the platform. Quite sharply. Interesting design, I thought, but considering we had very little time before the train left, I didn't let this stop me. I pushed Angela onto the travelator, took a few steps forward. A little late, perhaps, my brain kicked in and I thought, oh, this is a lot steeper than I was expecting. I'd better stop walking before I lose control of Angela's wheelchair. As I said, this is a little late, as I had, in fact, already lost control oh, good. of the yeah. wheelchair. Right. The wheelchair containing a rather shocked Angela was rapidly <laughs> gathering pace, but fortunately it was the early afternoon there was only one other person ah. on the travelator. It's where it becomes a bit like a cartoon here. Yeah. <laughs> As it sped up, the sound of the wheelchair careering down the travelator echoed round the station and reached a similar crescendo to a herd of elephants. The other travelator passenger, a young, stylish businessman, looked over his shoulder and did the only thing he could do, <laughs> which is to run as fast as his smartly clad legs would carry him. Right. His briefcase was thrown in one direction, his newspaper in another, as we involuntarily chased him to the bottom of the travelator. As we hit the bottom, Angela flew out of her wheelchair, but due to two fortunate facts, she had a hold all full of clothes on her lap, and she's a black belt in karate, exactly. who has extensive experience of falling safely. <laughs> she was completely uninjured. The businessman also uninjured and other passengers raced to help Angela back in the chair whilst I was flat on my face wrestling with my trainer lace that had become entangled in the escalator but aside from an escalator shaped cut in my left knee in which I still have the scar I was also uninjured I think that makes you injured actually but yes. apart from that she was uninjured we thanked our saviors reassembled our belongings and hobbled off to catch the train with literally moments to spare all the way back we cackled with laughter at our close escape and how hilarious we must have looked but years later I'm still a little uneasy Father Simon so I need forgiveness not for Angela as on my return home I, I wrote a stinky letter to said train company about their poor signage and we received free first class tickets to Paris in fact in the terminal on our return from Paris Angela leant across and said, shall we do it again? <laughs> <laughs> no. no, no, that's not. Neither do I seek forgiveness for all the other passengers who had their <laughs> journeys interrupted by my stupidity. However, I do seek forgiveness from the businessman who, whilst completely minding his own business, was chased by a woman and her friend in a wheelchair <laughs> at breakneck speed down a travelator without any warning. Yours, Beatrice. P.S. I'm an occupational therapist. I mention this. It won't mean much to you, but we'll give other OTs listening an extra reason to giggle. We're meant to support people in their recovery, <laughs> not attempt to introduce new ones. Well, um, hardcore confession listeners will remember we had a very good occupational therapist confession which revolved around the fact that it was almost impossible to explain what an OT does simply. So when this OT was confused for a nun, uh, <laughs> she actually did say a few uh, words of blessing at a funeral. So yes. that's, yeah. that's the way that one went, which maybe we could do as a confession from the crypt. Anyway, Beatrice uh, is the one who wants uh, some forgiveness from Sister Bobby there. Well, I'm going to attend to both of you, actually. Oh, uh, basically, Beatrice and Angela, what are you two like? Uh, I wish you were my best friends. I've got some good friends, but I could always do with more. You two sound like an absolute, oh, uh, what storm. Uh, it's great, isn't it, when you get a potential story going all well in the end. And I you can only... imagine being that businessman yeah. turning around and thinking, I, I, I'm in trouble here. The thing is, how many times have you seen someone fall over? If they don't hurt themselves and they can laugh themselves, it's absolutely fine and then you can laugh. But genuinely, you're all sitting there going, oh, 
So it's brilliant. I don't think actually he would mind. And I think I'm sure he told lots of people and had a really good laugh of it. So you are forgiven, Beatrice and Angela. Yeah, if you want a new best friend, I'm your woman. I think being a black belt in karate sounds like the really cool thing to, to yes, be. Yes, yeah, well, it is. This. Absolutely. I, I, I'm going to forgive for that reason. Number one for describing karate is basically the art of falling over, which makes perfect sense to me. But also because here, I, people who stand on travelators, I have never understood... The point of the travelator is to get us all there uh, quicker than we need to get them, them walking. There's no point in... We're not in an aquarium. We're not going under the sharks flying. We're, we're supposed to be getting somewhere quicker. There's no point in... This business... He's standing on the travelator. I'm going to let that take the, or take, 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 take the strain. No point at all uh, behind that. Uh, so I am definitely going to forgive because no one should be standing on the travelator. Dear Father Simon... Sister Bobby, Brother Matthew, and the Diocese of Radio 2 listeners. Let me take you back to... Uh, actually, we're in uncharted territory with this story a little bit. Let me take you back to 1999, when following a successful year, the boss of the company my husband worked for invited us both for a tour of the factory where they made their TV lighting equipment. Now, this wouldn't normally interest me, but the factory in question was in Rome and they offered to fly us over for the weekend to explore the city before visiting the factory on Monday. Nice gig. Saturday was spent traipsing around Rome using a tourist map we'd been given at the hotel. And by Sunday afternoon, we had just one thing left on the map to see. The problem was neither of us was really sure what the building was that the concierge had circled for us. But after squinting a bit, my husband had a light bulb moment I think it's the television station, he said, pretty confidently. And given the company that had paid for our trip made TV lighting equipment, we of course felt obliged to strike this last place off our map. We followed the directions and on turning into a crowded square, we were faced with a very impressive palace-like building. Parked up alongside it were many outside TV broadcast vehicles with their satellite dishes pointing out uh, skywards. I told you, says my husband triumphantly, it's the Italian equivalent of the BBC. Are you sure? I questioned. It does look a bit posh. He got them. I don't know what she's thinking about our building, but anyway. <laughs> he got the map out and began studying it again. It was at this point that an elderly gentleman came over and began talking to us. It transpired that he spoke a similar amount of English as we spoke Italian. So my husband reverted to his usual approach when speaking to those from abroad. He spoke slowly and loudly with lots of hand gestures. Oh, good. Television e station e really? he inquired in his best Italian accent, just adding an e to everywhere. Yeah, because that definitely works. Television e station e says again. <laughs> Parliamento came the reply. Ah. Oh, is is there Parliament building? My husband proudly translated. <laughs> hmm. I say. So why does he appear to be praying as he says it? Well, the man then began looking at his watch and span his finger around it backwards, along with various other gestures. After about ten minutes of playing a bizarre form of charades, where neither player understood a word the other was saying, my husband concluded that this was obviously a museum of Italian parliamentary history. And <laughs> obviously... Yeah, very much in demand. And gestured yeah. that we would like to see inside. See, si, said the gentleman, visibly relieved that he'd finally been able to communicate with us so effectively. He took us to a queue at the door and bid us arrivederci. It was as we entered and our trainers sank into the thickest pile, red, red pile carpet that we'd ever stood on, that we suspected something was amiss. I tugged at my husband's raincoat and whispered, I don't think we should be in here. He agreed and we glanced back at the doors through which we'd just entered to find them shut and bolted. People were being let in in groups. We were now locked in. The guards inside all had weapons, from swords to guns, and they looked like they, could t they were taking their job very seriously. The nearest soldier to us motioned with his eyes that we should proceed up the stairs, so we reluctantly turned back to face the wide staircase and climbed very slowly. As we did so, we realised all the other visitors to the museum were dressed in suits, or very expensive gowns with jewellery, whereas we were dressed in matching cagoules, clash t-shirts and jeans with rucksacks on our backs. On reaching the top of the stairs, we turned to face a corridor that seemed to go on forever. 
It was like a dream, this whole sequence. Halfway down, there's a TV camera pointing at us with bright lights and a very beautiful lady adorned in a black evening gown and a sparkling diamond necklace. Next to her stood an immaculately dressed gentleman in the finest suit I'd ever seen. We froze like two English tourists caught in TV camera lights because that's exactly what we were. After what seemed like an eternity... The lady discreetly but impatiently motioned that we were to be walking towards her while she maintained a fixed smile on her face. As we inched our way along the carpet, our legs had turned to jelly and our insides were doing all kinds of strange contortions. We grasped each other's hands tightly and walked in silence, staring at the lights ahead. As we finally reached the lady and gentleman, we were beckoned into a stateroom that wouldn't have looked out of place at Buckingham Palace. Cameras and lights were positioned in every corner, all pointing at the centre of the vast space where sat a large wooden coffin. Oh, no. I can only assume that it was due to the tension that I'd felt thus far and the nightmare scenarios that had played through my mind of what we might face that made me at this point have a sudden and extremely loud fit of the giggles. Uh-oh. And as much as I tried to stifle them, they just kept bursting out, sometimes through my mouth and sometimes through my nose. My shoulders were shaking, and I kept letting out a high-pitched squeal as I bit my lip. The cameras in the room swung round to focus on us, and tears began to run down my face, but tears of laughter, not sadness. My husband said things like, There, there, dear. <laughs> in a loud voice to make out that I was overcome with grief. But under his breath, he was begging me to stop. It didn't work, though, because as we drew nearer to the coffin, containing who knows, my hysterics were now at fever pitch. My husband, meanwhile, had also begun a fit of the giggles, and in an attempt to hide the fact, he was biting his finger so hard he started to bleed, whilst his other hand was pressing my head into his coat, pretending I was overcome with grief. <sighs> finally made it out without further incident we didn't really gaze very much at the coffin the following morning we were collected from the hotel by the company director as we drove to the factory we asked casually who was lying in state in such an impressive building and he replied Leonilda Jotti we were none the wiser a much loved or hated member of the communist party depending on your persuasion <laughs> You don't want to mess with them. He almost crashed the car when he heard that we'd been to pay our respects. Oh, no. But we need to seek forgiveness from many people. Firstly, the Italian Communist Party, for appearing to find the demise of one of their most loved and treasured women so hilarious. We genuinely didn't, honest. But most of all, forgiveness for a, a young, very pale-looking Australian tourist who came up to us in the square afterwards. Transpired he'd seen us join the queue and thought, if they can get into the Palazzo Monte Cittorio dressed like that, and so can I. And he'd queued up and gone through the next batch and told us, I've never been that close to a dead person, especially one I don't know. And it looked as though we might have traumatised him for life. And so we basically, for this particular reason, we fall upon you and your collective for their mercy. I mean, and I checked it all out. 1999, this, guy, this woman, uh, Nilda Jotti, uh, died. It was lying in state and it's not... not Presumably, the, you wouldn't expect it to be a leading member of the Communist Party uh, with all that pomp and circumstance. But anyway, they were in there. They were scruffy. They didn't know what they were doing. But uh, what do you think, Sister Bobby? <laughs> well, it's that thing, isn't it? It's the perfect sitcom. It's the perfect farce. You have no idea. There was no, I mean, there was no malice in them. They weren't trying to get. They weren't trying to get into something they shouldn't have got into. They were just trying to see the building. Obviously, it was a complete mistake. So I, d I don't think there's any malice in this at all. And also, you're genuinely sorry. I don't know how you hid it so well. Really, in that the thing is, with one of those things, fake it until you make it. It's one walking across the carpet. You should have just thought, right, we belong here. It's the only way yeah. I think to get through. So having said that, I had not seen that coming. I expected I them to walk into all <clears throat> sorts of things, but I hadn't expected that. That's a great story. You are forgiven. I wasn't expecting that, as the song goes. Mm. I don't think the Italian Communist Party have made it into a confession before. No. Maybe the first of many. I, I, I would say uh, grossly overlooked so far. I, I like Bobby, was think I, so many things were racing through my mind as to what they were going to see when they walked through that door. Uh, and, it, yes, the what do you think it was leader be? of the Italian Communist Party lying in state <laughs> was not... Was not 
chief among them, I was thinking it was going to be something papal. But uh, but this this was superb because we had none of us had any clue what what, what was going to happen next. So I loved it. But we do love a queue, don't we? Is there a queue? Yes. Right. Well, I'm getting involved in that then. And it appears anyone could get in, even people who were wearing Clash T-shirts and had a big rucksack on. So uh, so nothing to forgive. Father Simon and the Collective, my family are avid listeners to your show and often listen to the confessions whilst enjoying our evening meal together. This, um, I, I'm just wondering... <laughs> now we know. Well, no, I'm just wondering whether I should PG it. Yes. No, it's all right, it's OK. Also, it, it, it's tea, isn't it? It's tea time, really. Half five, if you're having it now. T tea. What? Evening meal, tea time. What are you talking about? Well, now? where I'm from, tea, supper... It's not about where you're from, it's where yeah. Joseph is from. Sorry, real and name, Joseph says, possibly. enjoying our evening meal together. Um, and the great thing about evening meal is it, could be it any time. covers everything. Okay. okay, sorry. Tea, dinner, lunch, whatever. <laughs> this recently got me thinking, the key thing is they're all listening together. Yes. Yeah. You, know, they're, you know, that's what's happening. Eating. This recently got me thinking about an incident some years ago when I was a detective working in the drug squad. <laughs> okay, so instantly. Straight away. Yeah. Yeah. Aye, aye. What's going on here? Young fella. In order to maintain my anonymity, I'll refer to the location of said incident as a Crown Dependency in the British Isles and hope this affords me sufficient protection from being identified. About ten years ago, my team and I were investigating a local syndicate... <laughs> <laughs> who are wow. believed to be involved in the supply of controlled drugs. This, we have gone on a different level. So automatically, <laughs> yeah. you're thinking, OK, mm -hmm. where is this going to take us? <laughs> is there any food in it? <laughs> <laughs> it's more like Crime Watch, yes, really. <laughs> Don't be scared. One particular day, information was received which suggested that two members of the syndicate who lived in a small village were in possession of a quantity of drugs at their address. I say this should be a PG. <laughs> A search warrant was obtained and a team of officers, including yours truly, were briefed and tasked with the search. There was no answer at the house when me and my fellow officers arrived, but entry was gained by using what is commonly known as the Big Red Key, which is essentially a heavy metal battering ram, which broke down the flimsy door without a problem. After establishing that nobody was in the house... There's no one in the house, Sarge! It's all clear. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you do, is it? Well done. You're like, Look, you know you yeah. Look out, it's the Rosers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're the Rosers. Get out. Yeah. Anyway, after establishing the area, a systematic search of the house was made, and I volunteered to search the small kitchen area. We're about to take a big left turn, by the way. Oh. When I went into the kitchen, I saw that there was a rabbit hutch on the floor. There you go. Okay. See? Which contained a rather nervous looking rabbit. Curiously, another rabbit was wandering around the kitchen freely, completely freely, and I assumed that it had somehow escaped from the hutch, although it wasn't obvious how this could possibly have happened, as the door to the hutch appeared to be secure. Anyway, I got on with the search, and after a while the rabbit was starting to get under my feet just a little bit and be rather annoying, so I decided to return it to the hutch to avoid stepping on it or tripping over it. I opened the door to the hutch and put it inside with a nervous-looking rabbit who had been there all along. <laughs> now looking even more nervous. Yeah, go on. <laughs> I continued with the search. I continued with the search. <laughs> but a short time later, I heard a rapid knocking sound coming from the direction of the hutch. Oh, yes. I cast my eyes downwards mm. and saw yep. that the rabbit, which had previously been wandering around the kitchen freely, was now yep. spending some serious <laughs> quality time yep. with the... <laughs> nervous looking rabbit which was now looking petrified well it is kissing day isn't it so it is it's very for international kissing day <laughs> yeah. because i was focused on the task in hand a bit like <laughs> rabbit, I, I, I took little notice of the rabbits and just assumed that they were being rabbits yeah which is after all true when the search was completed in the interest of ensuring things were left as we had found them apart from the smashed down <laughs> door I removed what I now realised was the male rabbit from the hutch and left him wandering around the kitchen again, which is what he'd been doing when we arrived. When later I thought about what had happened, I realised that the rabbits were being kept apart as presumably the owners didn't want any baby rabbits. Some weeks later, an informant reported to me that the owners were trying to give away a number of baby rabbits, but had been completely astonished about this because as far as they were concerned, the rabbits hadn't had the opportunity to, uh, to, to meet. <laughs> What had happened was clearly scientifically impossible. 
I realized that it was my intervention that had led to this situation, and so I seek forgiveness for my failure to be honest and bring what had happened to the attention of the house occupants and suspected drug suppliers, who probably believed that some sort of miracle had taken place. However, in mitigation, a number of people ended up with lovely fluffy baby rabbits, which I'm sure made a number of children very happy. Oh, as a PS, says Joseph, no drugs were found during the search. OK, well, that's it. So that's a, it's a clean kind of story. Did he check the hutch? Just asking. Well, as, I don't know. That's, that's, that's quite interesting because that would have been a very clever place. Like maybe, I don't know, in, in with the sawdust. That's why the rabbit was nervous. Again, Bobby, you're straight to that. That's absolutely right. The, ner- the nervousness was not because of Jack Rabbit. It was off his head. Yeah. The fire. Yeah. Yeah. It was because Columbo, <laughs> Lady, Lady, Ra- Lady Rabbit was, was hiding the drums. <laughs> Very clever. You're in the right. You should be like a... Uh, it's one day only, de- it won't a last. detective. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so what do you say then? Uh, it's, well, first of all, Joseph, you had the safety of the original rabbit was your main concern. You didn't want to step on it. You didn't want to lose it. Let's put it back in its cage. It's obviously your lack of knowledge of uh, animal husbandry that has uh, brought this about because first of all it's really annoying you shouldn't have got involved but then you're thinking well actually you were trying to take care of the rabbit there were bigger issues know. there were bigger issues there were bigger issues about. it was your unfortunate rabbit ignorance that led to this and if they did find good homes afterwards then that's everything is okay so on this occasion you're forgiven he was just being a good copper wasn't he he was well, just yeah, thinking I think well so. i need to just yeah. make sure that i'm doing he my job he didn't lose the properly. rabbit that could would have been even worse so in on this occasion you're forgiven uh, novice, Nigel. Good. WPC prior has a certain ring to it. It was very, yeah, yeah, very good. good. Uh, well, a lot of miracle conceptions. Uh, door broken down. Uh, no drugs found. I mean, there's a lot going on. But for the reason, but I can't forgive you, Joseph, because you said, "Me and my fellow officers." I should be uh, my fellow officers. Yeah, and I, and absolutely. You've just, a number of people are already texting. Yeah. Yeah. I bet they are. I bet they are. And it was just like. It's unlucky, isn't it? Was you obviously better thought they're having a bad day because someone smashed their door in, uh, and also um, because uh, they ended up having with a pregnant rabbit. So what going on? But no, Joseph, because of your uh, take on your poor take on English, you're not forgiven. I, I wonder if they actually tried to blame the broken door on the rabbit that the rabbit was because <laughs> it was a big rabbit and it was a big, a very big rabbit, and it was going around yeah. and it was getting more and more incensed. It, yes. yeah, it was us. It was the rabbit that knocked you off. Yes, it's gone very watership down, very dark, isn't brother. It? Matthew. Well, I, I think this this confession falls into the category of what would we have done if we'd been in the same position? I have to say, if I'd been in a kitchen and there'd been a rabbit in a hutch and another rabbit getting under my feet and getting in the way, then I'd say, well, obviously the rabbit goes in the hutch. The dog goes in the kennel, the fish go in the bowl, and the rabbit goes in the hutch. This is like it's a life much, philosophy. It is how uh, the circle of life, once again, we see with the rabbit. It's very much what their... Uh, nature intended so i would say definitely simon and the forum of forgiveness can i just say before we continue that this there is reprehensible behavior in this particular story which okay. is not condoned i'm just saying this sounds good no no no. i'm just yeah it's not particular it's not outrageously wow. reprehensible but this gets past the lawyers i went to school at an inner city comprehensive in the northwest of england where the only form of extracurricular activity came in the way of weekend camping trips for senior pupils organised by our head teacher, Mr Barker. The format for these weekends was always the same. Fourteen seniors and the head would pile into the school minibus and set off for the site with accompanying staff following along in their own cars. This always included the woodwork teacher, who towed a dinghy behind his car so he could spend the weekend <laughs> sailing it. Good for him. Classic woodwork behaviour. Yeah. Now, our school being an inner-city comprehensive, a lot of the pupils didn't fancy the idea of camping, so it turned out that the same old faces kept turning up. A favourite venue of Mr Barker's was a field in Snowdonia, with a stream running down one side where we could wash and also canoe, and a lake at the end uh, where we could sail in the woodwork teacher's beloved dinghy. Now, it has to be said that there was some serious tent inequality in this particular camp, The rest of the party had two-man ridge tents, but Mr Barker's abode for the weekend was a huge frame tent known to us regulars as Buckingham Palace. (laughs) Here Mr Barker spent the weekend with his entire family, who followed on by car and consisted of his wife, son, daughter and his psychotic dog, Fido. (laughs) After, After the journey... I think these trips sound quite fun. Apart from the washing in the river bit. After the journey... 
tent pitch and meal on Friday. An early night was called for, but on the previous Saturday nights during these weekends was something different. We would be fed our evening meal. Then, if the weather was good, the staff would build a bonfire for the children and retire to the large meal tent whilst we sat unsupervised round the roaring blaze. Someone would check, us, uh, check on us at various intervals, but this became less frequent as the night wore on and we would eventually be told to go to bed. Next morning, the contents of the camp rubbish bin would give mute testament to our lack of supervision, lots of tins and bottles with labels which included the words percent proof on them. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. After a fairly humdrum day of activities on this particular Saturday, uh, the evening came round and bang to form, the staff retired to their meal tent. Mr. Barker and his family were in Buckingham Palace, lording it up as usual, and we were happily sitting unsupervised round the blazing fire. Out came our special lemonades and a good night was in the offing. Now, to make obviously, there's lots of reprehensible mm, behaviour. Obviously. Yes. obviously. We don't condone no. that. No. Now, to make sure that we weren't discovered, we'd arranged a simple system. If the flap of the teacher's meal tent or Buckingham Palace so much as twitched, our spotter would simply burst into song, <laughs> giving us time to hide the contraband. Our infrequent checks were accompanied by such campfire favourites as Row, Row, Row Your Boat, Kumbaya, my lord, <laughs> and rather appropriately, ten green bottles. Oh, very good. This system worked very well on the night in question until later in the evening when a flap twitch resulted in a rousing chorus of Old MacDonald Had a Farm and a shadowy figure approached the bonfire. People rushed to hide the illicit beverages and then, as the figure got closer, we realised that it was, in actual fact, Mr Barker's daughter. Oh, I. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Who's the same age as us? She wants to sing as well. <laughs> what are you up to? She asked. Are we just sitting and having a sing? Said one of our number, trying desperately to hide the can of pale ale that he'd been quaffing. That's beer! She exclaimed, because she's pretty smart. We hold our breaths. Was she about to reveal our ghastly secret to her dad? We waited. We waited a few more seconds, and then she said, Can I have one? So, phew, a tin was hesitantly passed over. Thanks, she said, sitting down on a log. Now, what are you really up to? It must be said that the rest of the evening passed very convivially. And when time was called, we all went to bed very relieved that our secret had been kept. Of course, next morning, the camp bin was overflowing with the results of our evening, something none of us had thought to address at the time. In the cold light of morning, I realised we had a problem. Surely there was no way Mr Barker would miss this pile of cans and bottles. Well, he didn't. Mr. Barker didn't hesitate to reprimand the guilty party over the contents, or who he believed to be the guilty party, because it turns out that the teachers had also had something of a night of it in the meal tent, and after our breakfast we could hear Mr. Barker giving them a thorough talking to over their consumption of lemonade from the night before. Quite right. But well, it turns out that they were at a loss to explain the sheer volume that had been consumed. The only reason they could think of was the fact that we were sharing the field with another set of campers, a party of RAF cadets, <laughs> who must have used, obviously, they must have used our bin yeah. to dispose yeah. of their own evidence. Makes sense to you me. can't trust them RAFs. Yeah. So anyway, Father Sam, I need forgiveness from those members of staff who had such a hard time from the head over their perceived level of alcohol consumption, from the RAF cadets who were blamed, even without knowing it, for the problem, and from the head himself, for leading his perfect daughter astray. I must say that now I work with young children, I'm regularly uh, checked and would not condone this behaviour at all. But as we say, different times. Yes. Now would seem an appropriate time to say different times. That is Andy's defence, really. And, uh, and obviously now that kind of thing wouldn't happen because uh, teachers are far more astute and clever and smart on Quite the case. Right, and, yes. they, mm. and also teachers don't drink anymore. That's also true. At all. At all, ever. Yeah. No. Particularly if they're on school trips. <laughs> yep. Because I need to set an example. And as for the head, well. So, um, Sister Bobby, what do you think? It's tricky. This is such an idyllic, lovely camping trip. I think you are very, very, very lucky children to have teachers that want to take you camping. Because you can imagine they might want to break from you. But no, they took you with them, which is really, really lovely. And also left you to your own devices, so you had some time on your own, which is great. Generally, I think there was no harm done generally. And it seems that you were actually quite well, what's the word, behaved with what you were drinking with the lemonade. It wasn't yes. kind of too much. You kind as of far kept as we it, know. you know. That's, uh, I think really I'm going to have to forgive because it seems that no harm's done. 
at all. So it's a quite easy forgiver. All right, Brother Matthew? I, I have to say, if someone told me that I was going to have to wash myself in a stream for a week, I would need <laughs> quite a lot of very strong alcohol to get me through that. Um, but, so, not when you, but not when you were at not school. Not obviously when I was at school, that said. I mean, uh, where were the showers? There was no showers at all? I'm going to have to go in the river? That makes no sense. They didn't have showers um, Obviously, days. back in those days, different times. Um, so, I am, I am minded to forgive because, you know, there's only one way of getting through that, particularly with a psychotic dog running around as well. Yes. I, yes, I'm... I'm...